Caruso is going to tell us how to jump across to their eighth dimension. Hey. <laughs> well, here we are. So, I think I think Dr. Brownback said that. People tell me I'm prolific, and I, I guess I am inclined to agree. I'm a polymath who researches and publishes in almost two dozen disciplines. My best year was about 22, a couple of few books and chapters and a number of papers. I say that because since March, I've been able to do absolutely nothing. I barely got the webmastering done for Vigier and the program just kind of like it was hour by hour. And uh, set aside a couple of days. I wanted this to be a masterpiece, which is a thing that really, not embarrassed by it, I'm just disappointed. I was going to spend about six months making this, you know. And everything also got in the way of that. The power cord broke and I couldn't, that's why I couldn't make the program, couldn't have access. And I set aside a couple of days in Belgium to work, you know, a couple of good 20 hour days with, you know. But they wanted 300 quid for the train because there was some strikes in the head. So I took a bus for 30 quid. Of course, that was a 30 hour trip. <laughs> Let me off at Victoria Station at 2 o'clock in the morning and found my way to uh, whatever station at 5 in the morning and waited until. 8 or 9 for the train, and then when I got here, of course, I had to sleep for another day, so... I wondered, well, should I give an impromptu talk, or just, you know, because I'm, I'm good at cerebral diarrhea. <laughs> but uh, I managed to put a few slides together, they're not in the order, and I apologize for whatever criticism Lou leaves out, because anything I say, I'm blaming on him, because he, you know, I can... Uh, okay, so um, we're on the brink of an imminent paradigm shift to unified field mechanics, and I've always been shocked at how many physicists won't, there's so many who are even want to say that discount quantum mechanics and try to do everything classically, but hardly anybody seems to want to start doing the work that, uh, in higher dimensional space, which is uh, required. Um, I thought this was a great, the eighth dimension is part of, I use a 12 dimensional model, so the uh, eighth dimension is the first complex set going beyond Elizabeth Rauscher used a lot of eight dimensional uh, superluminal Lawrence boosts that transform a spatial dimension into a temporal dimension, so I do it again to turn it into an energy dimension and you get to use the uh, Use it to broke me more than kind of knowledge. Uh, I remember from the Berkeley um, conference in 2000, a number of people wanted me to reject Milo Wolf's paper. And he didn't care about making correspondence, although he was talking about direct spherical rotation, so one could, you know, assume something. But but I couldn't kick him out because he let Mitad Sanaga from the Slovak Republic stay in his house for a week or ten days. And he was a horrible guest. He spent all his time ironing his socks and all that kinds of things. Anyway. But I, in the conversations, I, I asked him, he, he told me, uh, I have the same training as any physicist does. I assume that in, that's true 95% for undergraduate bachelor's physics, but these things start to diverge by master's degree, and I know for a fact by the time you get your PhD and on a particle physics corridor at a major university, the guys in the next office can't understand a word of your, what you're saying. And I say this because Lou especially, Peter a little less vocally, but I'm proud and, you know, it, it, you know, we, Lou and I go, go back a little way and said, um, I don't understand the word that you're saying. And, you know, and I appreciate that and I, 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 I pondered that for a little while and I realized while physicists have the training that in 
you know, classical quantum GRSR and relative and um, standard models of cosmology. String theory is not in the group that you can expect people that have, have bothered to spend, you know, some years studying. And that, that made sense to me because my model, it's not anything much to do with the standard applications that string theorists are doing, but I've made a unique string theory model. And uh, so at some point, I may try to do a little bit of that today, but that was a major error, because if, if Lou and Peter especially, since uh, kind of trying to coordinate efforts with them, had understood what I was doing, you know, five years ago, we'd maybe be a little bit farther. Uh, my talk in, um, in Berkeley was to be about a directed energy beam technology that would suppress wildfires by um, blocking, by not allowing oxygen to re release its electrons. And we're one experiment away from having all of these things, and some of them are a little more difficult than others. They all, as far as I can see, require a quantum computer. Richard, could I make a comment about the, I don't understand the word they're saying? Yes, um, is that, if that's the most important thing that he said. It's a piece of language which is a sort of like a kicking someone in the shins or pushing them a little bit. It, it isn't a statement of fact or uh, it has no truth value. It, it means uh, uh, try again or something like well, that. And, you know, and I, I, I took it, I didn't take it as this, you were my enemy or the bully beating me up. I. I, you know, it took the tax, that was, could have been even three years ago, but, you know, I'm probably not until the next end of the yeah. You could do what Dirac did, just carried on talking. Yeah. Oh, the guy okay. says, I didn't understand what you said. Well, well, why don't you answer my question? So it's a statement, not a question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more inclined to do what Feynman did, but it, it, you can't get away with it as much, or he called everybody idiots, even to their face, and just, you know, the whole conference is a bunch of IQ twos, and, I have nobody to talk to, but anyway. Anyway, taking the heart, and I'm, I'm going to do something about that by the time I hopefully write the paper. I didn't go anywhere. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this is what we generally think of as the quantum stochastic foam. And I suppose the little blue balls we could say are. Peter's virtual Zitterbewegung, 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 space and life space, uh, whatever. Currently, there's three methods to try to, for attempts to discover additional dimensionality. CERN, their main one is called Gravity's Rainbow. No time to talk about it. You can Google that and find plenty of papers on the archive. Unified field theory will soon make particle accelerator is obsolete because the, the bigger and bigger cross-section energies that are needed to get into the blockage that the uncertainty principle requires will be physicists have rejected the Dirac polarized vacuum because they think it in, interferes with gauge theory which has been so successful but it does not and I think most agree that you can't have a Casimir effect without a Dirac polarized vacuum Anyway, it's the direct polarized vacuum that is going to allow all of this stuff. Quantum uncertainty is a sacrosanct, proved many, many times experimentally. And they have a method that they do that for. So the first simple answer is to do something else. And let's see what we got. Um, same thing, we don't need that. Um, my slides are not in order, so I'll just do the best I can to shuffle around. If we assume that this rosebud represents a Bohr atom in free space <coughs> with the petal layers representing electron orbitals, you know, that's not an impossible metaphor. I just thought this was kind of fun to uh, get some Schrodinger cats and people kind of playing around. But so then, to extend that Bohr three or four space rosebud to, I use a 12 dimensional string theory because it's that extra degree of freedom when I boost the, do the second 
Superluminum Lawrence Booth gives me the super quantum potential, <coughs> yada yada, which becomes the the unified field does not provide a fifth force, it provides a coherent force. It's a, it's a force of coherence which combines elements of all of other four forces. Um, so that, um, that the twelfth dimension is part of what allows the force of coherence to operate in the, in the higher dimensional topology. Calabiao is a Kalem manifold and the Riemann sphere is also in that category. The thing about Kalem manifolds is you can, they're infinite iterations, so there's, you can't argue with them. An early model of uh, what, I don't know if, I remember if this was an electron or an atom or something like that, but anyway, I want to go back to this. Well, we'll skip over this, Let's see what we get. Uh, the other, oh, so gravity's rainbow at CERN and perhaps a Chinese super collider. Hope C.Y. Yang tried to get them to not build it, not for the reasons, but hopefully they won't miss, waste the near half a trillion dollars in building it, because probably by the time they get it done, it won't be required. Um, I mentioned yesterday, synthetic or artificial dimensions have its discovered by the quantum hall anion graphene bilayer people. They're very timid about it and they're not fully calling them, uh, you know, normal space dimensions, but the methods of discovering them because of the topological phase and topological quantum field theory things involved will soon, I hope our team gets there first, but we need a hundred million dollars to be, if we're going to be the ones to do that, to take full advantage of it. If you wait until everybody's doing it, then you're just one of the... Can I have a comment on this? Because these people are Mike's group, and I know a little bit about what they're doing. The dimensionality of the city there is a dimensionality which sits inside a fabricated system. So one's looking at a dimensionality within a dimensionality. So it's not, it's not extra dimensions there, it's really just using the mathematics of dimensionality to... Well, uh, no, I've, I've looked at enough papers, and that's that's one, one method or interpretation. But there are other ways. There are there's other also others, you know. There, you know, it's the hottest topological phase transitions is the hottest topic in all of physics. Princeton is having a year of topological phase. Yes, last year I went to the uh, Advanced Studies Institute in uh, Singapore. They're also having that. Their thing was so sophomoric, it, it was really disappointing to spend all the money to go. They kind of were talking to, I don't know, high school students, so I didn't learn anything. And I went up to ask the question to one of the guys who got, anyway, I could ask something about Maharana Zero Modes. He said, oh, I didn't want to bring you to that up. And go, well, what the hell are you doing here? I don't know, but anyway. Um, so, Traditionally, for the last 80 or 100 years, the fermionic singularity has been zero-dimensional because if we try to add something to it, we get all the infinities and renormalization and everything. But uh, Peter has nicely developed this and not got recognized for it because anybody who does quaternions is ostracized and executed in one way or another. But, uh, so the, the simplistic model of the fermionic singularity, which we've been using historically in three space, and it's mere symmetric higher dimensional copies as over crossings and under crossings. Of course, the way it is here, it's just on a line and not, doesn't help us too much, but it begins to try to get us to Accept or want to be curious enough to go in the projection of I will projection of a nice I site. Yeah. So here's a better view now of uh, I think I took this figure from John Baez. I don't think Peter uses this cyclical, cyclical diagram in his work, but it, it represents the same thing. Where the right one would could be construed as the space and the left left one could be the anti-space. You have a 
And you can see one is rotating in one direction and then the other direction. I've come to the conclusion recently that the Dirac 360 720 um, rotation is, because of the uncertainty principle and this shadow is hiding another fact that, that uh, I'm not counting that one as the universe punishing me. Is it okay for you? No, I, I, you know what, I've stopped, I think in Belgium I ate five or ten pounds of bacon and you know, if you eat, trust me, the, the diet, you eat protein and vegetables, but I was still somewhat gaining weight, but since I've been here just eating vegetables, I, I know I've already lost five pounds, so, so I didn't get it, without, it would have taken it that long. Anyway, no time for nonsense like that. What was I saying? Old order multiplication. Yeah, the, um... Oh, the, the trefoil. So I, I, I haven't, I found, you, know, you can find all kinds of things on YouTube. I did find a guy that transformed a, a, uh, I can't even remember, a decline bottle or something into a trefoil or something like that. So there is, there is a way of trans, so I, I'm, what I'm saying without, without going into it, and that's a, probably even a, be another, an hour's talk to do it later on, is that this needs to be trying, you know, to be a system of trefoils doing their crossover topological moves. And I, I don't know if it was relevant, but I, Peter, Peter, you should go find Peter's paper on dimensionality from, uh, is that Portanovo or the one before? Yeah, I think it's Portanovo. Port I don't know which one it is. Yeah, anyway, find his paper on dimensionality. All of us should put our, the World Scientific Proceedings books are works of art, but they're, nobody gets them but us unless you buy the $200 book, so we should all put our papers on some archive. Um, so he made a case for why the space we observe needs to be, has to be three-dimensional. And whether it was logical for me to, but anyway, it was in thinking about that that I got the trefoil idea. I don't want to spend any more time on this. All right, so I visited Peter a couple of years ago, and I wanted to, Hamilton sacrificed commutivity when he developed quaternions. He first added the J and the algebra didn't close and his great insight walking across the bridge or whatever is to add the J and it closed the algebra which sacrificed commutivity. In order to have access to the, I have mostly theological reasons for higher dimensions and the physical ones are, have to do with there is no quantum gravity and stuff. I don't have, I don't have good arguments, just enough to want to do it. Um, so I spent some time with Peter trying to figure out how to break the algebra by, by having enough degrees of freedom in, in where, uh, you know, for example, an ambiguous Necker cube, if you rotate it, all of a sudden the vertices switch. So you could use that to collapse something. If you collapse some topological move, you're going to have, through enough iterations in 12 dimensions, I believe that's sufficient, you, uh, you're going to break. So anyway, we... We stacked up three sets of quaternions, which all in the Pullman course reduced back down. I, I didn't get that, that any thing about that paper. And, but those three sets of quaternions look like the three faces of a cube. And we have to do some more work on it to get the anti-space one. But so then you can. There's many many ways of doing this. I don't have much math in this because I need to get the wireframe topological geometry first because all the math would be just nonsense until you get the pathways. And I'll segue for a moment here. You can use math to do anything. Physicists have to confine their math to something that relates to the natural world. I think I heard, first heard this from Peter. There's something about quaternions, and they're the only algebra, except the octonians, but their regime hasn't come into bear yet until we get beyond the uncertainty principle, so that's not as evident. But something about the quaternions that have an in inherent component of the natural world built into them. So that's going to help. I think, to me, that's kind of a gift from God because finding, finding the new set of transformations that lets us violate the uncertainty principle, as we'll see as I work, ramp up this level, the complexity, to, to find the restrictions that reduce the complexity are... Um, so here's a picture of the uh, octonions with the quaternions embedded within them. And 
in this model, you'd have to have a, th where I said everything has to be tried, you'd have to have a third set, and that would be doubled again. Uh, anyway, but you begin to see, we'll begin to see how the degrees of freedom that become evident here. So, so are you doubling the Octonians? I'm tripling them. I'm okay. tripling everything. Okay. And I don't know if I have a picture of the final tri tripling, but so I triple, I first triple Peter's space, anti space, nil potent structure, and then I have to triple that again for, uh, for future past. We'll get to that in a minute. And then, so, so are these spaces that don't touch one another? So something in another member of the triple is not common with the first octet? They're, they're out of phase enough so that they can, and part of that is the way to set up the restrictions so that they will, you know, rectilinearly or whatever, separated. But I think I have them, I try to draw them as pictures separated, but I think they're in some kind of a, a dual, and now it's going to be a, a, tr a double, triple, or it's going to be a triple, the dual near symmetric Calabi-Yau three tori gets doubled, tripled, and then there's one more to get to the 12th dimension, and the reason for this is the mirror image of the mirror image is causally free, and I may need another little phrase in there, so that the quantum particle in the box in three space is then, when you have you're going to cyclically bring commutivity back in. So you have an avenue to send your signal. Um, so whatever you do to this quantum particle in the box doesn't touch the one in the 12th dimensional. It's the Riemann sphere is flipping. We're going to get back to the, the Riemann sphere is... So, so there aren't three inversions. I mean, it, it, oh, okay, so it's fine. Well, they're probably out. I mean, um, so you can you so as you program the computer and once you get your you're programming it continuously and reading it out without collapsing there's no worry about decoherence because the whole the system is large enough and that you're you're able to run through quantum states the mirror I don't have one here I don't have a copy of the mirror symmetry but the mirror the mirror symmetric states in between hold the same quantum state and different in some form of entangle or pseudo entanglement that keeps keeps the state entangled. The final both copies you have copies of the entangled state, so you can do some do whatever you want to either one and not have it affect the other one. Um, uh, so it ends up all about the restrictions that are going to be inherent in the quaternion octonian manifolds that are set up with uh, I don't have to know all the move, topological moves, the over and under crossings, rotations, and um, the right of Meister moves, and anything, but it, there's enough of them and you know it's going to take a, a little more effort and study to... Um, what, to what is the import of the thus? You say thus a true octonian contains three trifold amounts. What, what does that mean? Uh, I actually, I have to look up, I don't know if, that, if I have that in my book on, top, on quantum computing or not, but I, I, didn't, I didn't actually make that up. That was one of my delightful discoveries in wading through the literature. So, but that would be a point, that's a significant statement so that needs to be addressed and understood to um somebody said that yeah somebody said who well it would have been somebody like bias there's so few people working on quaternions and octonians that it was either bias or one of the people he mumbles about so um i think i pulled this out of the thing so if you google that you probably can find it and then and I'll, I'll try to do the same thing and get it, get it answered, get the question answered in the... But it came from also one of these diagrams. Uh, and there's probably only the single doubling here. So the one on the left, we could say, is a left rotation. And that needs a reversed one on the right. 
Um, I don't know if there was something about... Uh, there's something in the final plane that, that can be set up so that you have a, 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 a dual, some a trefoil. Um, and, but you, get, you begin to see, if you just hit this, beat your head against the wall with this without the restrictions, and there are some restrictions inherent in this categorization of the Jones polynomial. And you can see that the left and the right one, you can have them be, you can have it be a cube, you know, if you made, did the geometry right in. Yeah, well, that's, that's a state expansion diagram from Barnett-Thomas paper, but yeah. Barnett-Thomas paper, I can assure you, that's nothing about octonians. No, I, I, I'm not claiming that this, this one does. I'm, I put it up there just to show the, uh, we have, it has a trefoil, there's some trefoil workings into it, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making leaks without the interconnection, and I apologize for that, but... There's a connection by a chap called Robert De Marais, who was talking about selenians and uh, mock octonians and the connection with trefoils. I just downloaded a video from that, the Google search, and that's... Yeah, so far, I, I don't know if the Sidonians are going to be necessary or not. They, they might be like the ever in many worlds thing, which is an indicia of other dimensions, but not a relevant term. Uh, just kind of a symbol for untying the knots to get through a I tweak Lou's uh, big U a little bit. I think he, I stole it from Lou and I think he stole part of it from Wheeler or something like that. And now for a little intermission for some amoroso grape juice. <laughs> and um, last year, Sabah Karan wanted me to go to Palestine, Ramal, Palestine for Ramadan, and I was inclined to go just for, you know, the, having to pray for, you know, 30 days or something like that. I think that would be good and it was weight. But I was afraid of going there, so I decided to look the part. <laughs> I sent Sabah this picture. I, I bought the cap and the dish dasha and, and that. I, I was walking around the streets of Malaysia in this, and the young 20-year-old men would come up and call me uh, Imam and want a blessing, and so I said, no, and then I could see some older guys, said, I better not do this anymore because I'm going to get killed in, in um, Malaysia before I can get to Palestine. But anyway, I decided not to go. People said, like, why, why go to a place where your life is at risk? And, uh, you know, Lou is the topologist. We have to have, give him the... Uh, we have this SPQR, and that's the, our first initials of all our names, except Lou gets a Q for the Kaufman. And People should know that the devil you have me in front of is Don Conway. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. But, uh, yeah, I, I guess we should have the horns come another way so it doesn't look so... Uh, <coughs> um, just, Another, this is a, a more simpler look at basic crossover links used for anion fusion channels. Um, uh, I don't think I'm really going to talk about this. The, um, the, the topological quantum computing people are really trying to use Anion top uh, use Maharana topology to find a way to get at the protected uh, states of the Anions. And there's enough degrees of freedom in this so that uh, on the one in on the bottom, if that was a graphene bilayer, you know, the, you want to have topological phase transitions up through the higher dimensions when we figure out the restric restrictions for the wireframe flow so that uh, it will be a simple, well, let me back, back up a little bit to M theory. So, I, I took some, I was working on, uh, uh, what do they call the static, the later version of a static universe, Einstein static universe model, anyway, don't, as a non-believer in the Big Bang and 
proponent of tire light and photon mass. I looked into a model that Minas Cafatos had for, um, for taking R dot, the rate of expansion of the Hubble universe, and using it instead, internalizing it, so you had a you had all the energy of, that was used for expansion as part of an internal uh, state of just existence rotating in that energy. And um, a couple of years later, I used that model to um, do an alternative derivation of string tension. And at that point, I didn't know very much about string theory. And it was variable, which I liked because it would go along with the wheel of Feynman, Kramer, and the Bones, present as a standing wave of the future past, not a line that's but a hypospherical standing wave. And then I, um, in doing some work with Elizabeth Rauscher from one of her papers on the superluminal Lawrence Booths, I realized that there was a possible experiment that could be done to test for virtual tachyon tardon interactions as part of this class model. Then I finally read about the hadronic. I found, you know, of course, that one of the reasons, two of the reasons they abandoned the hadronic model is because they didn't, they didn't want to have a variable string tension input, and probably most salient, saliently, they thought a tachyon was non-physical. But if you have a little like the virtual particles in the Zitterbewegen vacuum, if the tachyon tardons are just little particles that ne are never realized, then that's that's really good, and it, it, it embellishes the Wheel of Feynman, the Kramer future past thing. So, um, so the other thing, string theory is looking for one unique, one compactification to the standard model of four space that has an independent, independent vacuum. And there's a Googleplex of possibilities, but this derivation of string tension gave one unique vacuum. It also gave me a very simplistic unified field equation, kind of at the level of e equals mc squared, just very simple, but I realized that it can be expanded to um, do its job. But I'm not much of a mathematician, so just another... Uh, the, um, so because of... This um, since probably for 15 years, I've been looking into uh, the least unit. I found a chapter in one of Kafatos's book where a fellow m used a Planck, a Planck uh, tessellation as the least unit. Of course, then I started thinking about adding, um, you know, the string. String tension is just a, an added little factor to the Planck constant. You know, it gives a little bit of space for like the Witten vertex or the Riemann sphere to rotate. Uh, um, I forgot. Um, uh, anyway, dimensionality, so So, one of the other things I left out, which would have been fairly obvious to helping people understand, accept my model. Oh, okay, compactification to one unique string, one unique background. Compactification, compactification for this four-dimensional standard model is what string theory is looking for, and of course all the quantum gravity stuff. But, um, so instead, and now I have a better reason for it. Kaluza's initial five-dimensional model didn't had a little bit of a problem, and Klein added cyclicality to it, and that took care of the problem. And you can look that up in the papers. It's kind of interesting. And physicists, most physicists, say that if there are extra dimensions, they have to be curled up at the Planck scale because we don't see them. It's not the only interpretation. If, like if you're in a movie theater, subtractive interferometry can have you can have lot, infinite size extra dimensions like Randall syndrome proposed. 
But the reality seems to be a little tricky. It doesn't want to give up a semblance of quantum gravity that easily. I, I am covered or de developed, I don't know what word to use, in, in the developing the theory that um, there's a semi-quantum limit, and that's that, at that limit, oh, so, segue again for a moment. So in my, I have a continuous state compactification compatible with the cyclicality of um, pose Klein dimensionality and uh, Wheeler, Feynman, and Kramer. That, all, that is so important to have this present as a standing way to the future past. It just allows for the eventual bringing in a cycle of commutivity, anti-commutivity, this whole big, um, so, um, remember the point, Richard. Um, uh, can't remember it again, sorry. Uh, continue on. Um, let's go forward for a minute, maybe we'll come back. So, you see in much of the literature that quantum mechanics is the basement of reality. It's an impenetrable barrier by the uncertainty principle, this stochastic foam. But if you, once you accept a direct polarized vacuum, you can create resonance. You're going to call these, they're, it's not a very good metaphor, but the little propellers can be like, Peters or some of these space anti space rotations and the cyclical rotations. And then the little resultants are the, the two sphere or the three sphere. It's interesting that we really don't know if, if as far as the physics of the observer, if we're, a, if we're flatlanders and there's some kind of a, a, a uh, super radiance that gives us. Like uh, even like making a hologram, you have a two-dimensional plate and shine the laser on it and get a 3D image. Or if we actually live on a three-sphere. So anyway, whatever representation, if that's a two-sphere or a three-sphere, it, it needs to be a Riemann sphere in this model because for the rotations that are coming. So that once you have this beat frequency inherent in the back cloth of space-time, that comes out of this continuous state compactification down the dimensional ladder. And I think because of the Heisenberg potential, once you're going to set up your resonances, whatever, whatever wavelength you choose, it's going to depend on the, the atom on the system that you want to use to set up your cursive oscillator to punch a hole in this direct vacuum into the Let's segue again a little bit now into the part of the experiment. Or should I go? I'll go one more first. The, um, again, it's all conceptual. I just two different views of a Calabio three man manifold, which would be a higher, and I don't know how far this goes up to, if it goes up to eight dimensions or whatever, but. It's just this thing is all going to be rotating, and um, it is rotating. There's a Feynman synchronization backbone. When you get that plugged into it, we get half of this for free, and that's going to be one of the major restrictions that's um, that's going to help get this done. But okay, so um, let's say you choose. Uh, well, we, we right at the moment. I want to try to write up an experiment from this. The National Institute of Standards of Technology, they have all the equipment, so it would just be a little money raised for, for people. Um, ten years ago, a fellow named Kramer uh, made a violation of quantum electrodynamics, but it, it wasn't quite enough for the people took much notice of it. He used uh, hydrogen and helium, I forget which. But then in 2012, he published work that he'd done over the prior decade. He used a titanium atom and stripped off the electrons, so in the center had a huge hydrogen atom or helium atom. And that violated 
QED at the Sigma Phi, so they couldn't ignore, ignore it anymore, and a few people started talking about Nobel Prize. So it's important to, you know, gauge theory is, is most physicists that I've asked don't seem to re realize or, or, or ignore the fact that it's just an approximation, so that there's all kinds of new physics. So and the fact that QED has been violated, one of the most perfect uh, theories we've ever had. Um, so, Vigier postulated tight bound states in hydrogen, or t just tight bound states in general, below the lowest bolt orbit. And at first I ignored that because, you know, how can there be more orbits below the lowest bolt orbit? And he two, with two of his colleagues from Serbo-Croatia. And 12 years later, I did a lot of work in cosmology and I, in, in thinking about this continuous state, uh, scenario, I, in this uh, clock, which, you know, loose clock could be applied to this. I wish I knew how to do that myself, it would be fun to, to do it, but you'd have to add more terms to take care of the other higher dimensional topological geometry. But. So we have this clock built into the background of space-time. So, in order to punch a hole in space-time, you take your hydrogen atom and resonate the electron so that it couples with the nucleon. Those shake in conjunction with space-time. And then if you apply also into the, into the resonance model the Dirac, the Dubois and cursive oscillator, the delta T in the simplistic form is the size of the hole you're going to punch. So you would match your your hole with the radius of the electromagnetic wave that you're going to punch the hole in. Now the first one will be fairly easy to uncover, like the summer fall for all field uh, born, whatever it was, when they made the corrections, it was a little trickier. So instead of just uh, in cursive or hypercursive oscillator, we're going to have to also embed a Bessel function because I've been postulating, postulated a manifold of uncertainty with a finite radius. That manifold of uncertainty has a number of dimensions inherent in it. Now because of this cyclical continuous state compactification, and well, since we're an ANPA with the big A, one of the reasons behind, we don't see it behind the uncertainty principle, is the gate has to open and close as part of this. It's not closed as if, if quantum mechanics was a base on reality, it would just be closed whenever. But it opens and closes because we live in time and there's some anthropic principle that needs a, a, um, a atemporal. Um, and if that sounds theological, it doesn't have to be said that way. Non-local EPR has shown instantaneous connection, so that's that's in pretty much the same bloody thing. So, um, so the 1895 hyperspherical volume equation, you can use that to make a preliminary approximation for the the, the new spectral line. The first spectral line in hydrogen is half an angstrom. The next one is two angstroms. So, I predict two with the third flying off to infinity, you know, you, you energize an electron, at some point it goes off to infinity. So if, if the manifold has only three dimensions, the third one will blow off to infinity, I think that's too simple. So with the mirror symmetry, there's gonna be six dimensions for it, and then after the fifth one, it will fly off to infinity. So the cavity, here's our, the three space cavity, and, and then the fourth, dimension opens and closes, the fifth dimension opens and closes, the sixth one and the fifth one and the sixth one and will fly off to infinity. So in order to access the large infinite size dimensionality of the unified Einstein's unified field, you have to set up your synchrony with all this topological stuff and you know you think about why this should be so complex, this gate. Why, why nature has made a gate that's not, I'm, I'm not going to speak on that today, but there's, there's some very interesting reasons why, why the gate should be that complex. The, um, 
So the first spectral line in the fourth dimension, uh, it will be fairly easy, but it'll have to be a little bit of better. That'll give us enough to start developing the theory better, but to get through the last three, it will take some a precise rendition of, the, of a best cell function with the incursive or hyper-incursive oscillator to open the gate all the way. You know, it's like um, you have revolving doors or a door and just just bump, you bump it just a little bit, this is obvious, and you're going to go and crash into the other wall. So to have that, and the, and the alignment is going to, I don't know how, you know, maybe because of the nature of the Heisenberg potential that we can, in a sense, program program the amount of time that the gate is open or get a handle on the cycle much better, but... All right, so when I said we're one experiment away, that is the one experiment. The, you do that experiment, you send out a signal, it sends back a signal, and, and you detect a picture of that, you've got a new spectral line. It's a little bit of phase changing. You run the quantum computer, you run those 24 um, technologies that I said all depend on this one experiment. Just little adjustment of this one experiment. In a sense, it's like discovering electricity. Once you have access to the higher dimensions and the energy of the vacuum, uh, all this comes. In some ways, I wish I was five years old, so over the next decades, uh, you get to play with all the new toys. In a sense, all the technologies we've had in the whole history of quantum mechanics didn't give us too much focus on a CRT television tube, lasers and stuff. But the amount of technology and amazingness of it with, um, uh, I don't know if it's written down what I want to say. I've been very timid about saying something, but I found some other physicists also even more timidly. I never published it, but the, um, the nature of reality itself. You know, physicists have hated the thing of the observer. We don't know what to deal with, but finally we're going to have to address it and finish, finish it. In an anthropic multiverse, it looks like, well, people have, you know, even Einstein said he couldn't imagine that the moon wasn't there if he wasn't looking at it. Well, it's not far off from the actuality of it. There's the, some anthropic, some global, universal anthropic principle that's looking at it, or that ha has it been contained, so that the things that we do with quantum mechanics, the little collapses to classical or non-collapse to use our little devices are one thing, but there's, some, there's another initial semi-collapse or whatever in this cycle that is cosmological, and that is the basis for an anthropic re reality. Great. Um, I don't know if there's. I can blubber on for a little while if, if either if nobody's understood anything I said and want me to go away. But if there's questions, I could maybe be more fruitful to address some of the questions. I realize. You know, you look at the beauty and, and in retrospect, the simplicity of the transformation from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. It was just you know, some simple little experiments. But this is, this is un, in a sense unbelievable. But once we have that transformation that allows all this, we'll look back and say, I can see why it was so hard to get there, but you know, it's going to also look unbelievably simple because we'll know just how to rotate all those things to get get a cycle of commutivity, anti-commutivity, and have them line up and play with the... Uh... Uh, so if there are questions, I'll, I'll kind of... Yes? It's just a, a general question. Um, if you weren't talking to us, but you were talking to, say, a 10-year-old child, mm -hmm. and you were trying to communicate what it is that you wanted to say, uh -huh. what would you say, or what would you do to draw them in to this world that you're in, that you, that where you can see the things that you see, what would you do? Um, I might have more. They showed a picture of Einstein's office. He had all kinds of little toys and gadgets on his table. I think I would use as many little toys as possible to try to. Um, 
I think I would start more with um, I would go through some of the more interesting, I would ask them maybe, I would say some of the things on this list, and what one do you find the most interesting? I mean, we all have ten. Huh? They are ten, so, um, what's the space bridge? Let's start with well, there's ten space. with subdivision, so there's actually over two dozen. All right, okay. But, I mean, it's about keeping it simple, really, and, and, um, and actually making a connection. Because I, I think you understand something. I, I, I think, I'm not sure. I do, and I have, I'm having a lot of trouble conveying it. Yes. If I had the wire form transform, yes. there'd be no trouble. I would yes. just, you know, I, okay, I, who wants the common elevator doesn't go yes. away. We, we can now have enough to get the money. In fact, I'm hoping to get $10 million when I get back to the U.S. because <clears throat> I believe, and get a copy of my quantum computing book if your library can afford it, you can't make a universal quantum computer without surrounding the uncertainty principle. And I don't know if that's evident in the topological quantum field theory with the protected state. You know, they've got a protected state, but they can't access it. So they've got the, the thing that won't take over here, but you can see that I have, I have a model that now needs to be tested. And so once, um, so there's 24 applications besides these, I don't know if they're part of it, they all need quantum computers. So maybe these are the same 24, two dozen multi-trillion overnight industries. So some of them overlap, so I need, need four to six think tanks spend each $10 million. And there are no real quantum computing algorithms in Hilbert space with, on a block sphere. That's, not, that's great for classical computing because all we need to do is the zero and ones, but it's not physically real. So we need, we need another, whole, uh, another whole thing. So maybe some of the algorithms that have been started for quantum computing, but we need to get algorithms for all the different things, and it's going to take a few. We already have the quantum computer. I've designed the thing. I can't run it without the... But Richard, so can I ask something quite concrete, which, which might help you understand? Yeah. Um, just looking at your list. Uh, number seven, gravity waves. Yeah. Uh, you've got this big thing on the side, all these require universal quantum computing. Well, gravity waves, as far as I'm aware, Entirely classical phenomenon in, G, in phenomena in GR. Uh, so, in what sense does the study of gravity waves, in your view, require universal quantum computing? And what can you say something specifically about your 7A? What would the possible applications of gravity uh, waves be? Einstein himself said that this was a convenient stopping point. So, and everybody, of course, you know, I'm sure you're thinking about the global antennas to measure a gravity wave, but well, I'm, I know a little bit about lying it, yes, but yeah. I, I just want to know what... No, there's another, there's another technology because of the nature of gravity where, where you can have a tabletop device that will measure gravity waves. And actually, I, and as I started preparing a talk, this could be my talk for per next year, I found a British, some British group which is going to use gravity waves similar to my model uh, that will look underground to find dinosaurs and things like that. Oh, I see. That's the, so there, there's a whole different class of technologies to use. Not the standard model in force space is it was like cavemen. You know, super collider is like cavemen smashing clubs together. We're gonna have a new kind of cross section when we get this thing done. Where when the continuous state, you time the model when the hats. I didn't get to talk about the nature of matter, which was the whole one of the whole things I wanted to do. But this cyclical, the brain structure of matter, it's going to come together and come apart. And this is very simplistic. But if you set, do your cross-section measurement when this is coming together, you have a low-energy tabletop measure cross-section to see the real structure of matter, much more simplistic. And this will, in, within a decade or so, make super colliders obsolete. But a child, I don't know what a child would, like I live in Los Angeles, 17 million, 17 million people in Los Angeles County. I, coming back from the north and I stopped at a rest area and I overslept. It took me uh, six hours to travel 15 miles. Self-drive cars are a little bit trouble. Once we have a quantum computer, any amount of data, so within, they say, 30 years maturity of self-drive and then within 50 years, tiered flying cars like in the sci-fi movies, traffic will be no problem. All of these... Back to the future. <laughs> yeah, all those places Play to have, um, Anyway, there's. I'm I'm kind of a five-year-old myself. I would I would get find what the child is interested in and then tell them something. Star Trek. Well. 
That's critical, isn't it? Find, find what the other person is interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Star, but, Star Trek. There's probably a few who are interested like I am, I am in all of these, and some of these are military. Uh, you know, we'll have a defense shield, it'll be a personal radiation shield, and you know, at first, I, I know a fellow who works for the DOD and he's building the, the, the DARPA lasers that will shoot down rockets. And I said, I said, you know, that's electromagnetic, that's a trailing edge technology, it, it is wasting billions of dollars. And then, and then I finally realized, in our lifetime, we've seen supercomputers super improve the prediction of weather. Once we have a quantum computer, no matter how many data points are required, we'll be able to have them. Then, wherever the vortex for a big hurricane is going to occur, we'll know just in advance, take one of those big laser things, or a couple of them, blast that vortex before it starts to form in a 200-mile wavefront, and they'll just have a tropical storm. The other thing is, anybody who has money, buy desert land because we're going to make it program rain in, in places. So, so weather control, you know, just, um, I don't know what my favorite, my favorite is, is the Star Trek medical tricorder. You get a gas, it would take months to heal, it heals it in a few seconds because you, you constructively interfere with the error of time. The other thing for that is grow protein, grow protein also, so that the, even if the world had trillions of people, it won't, but we could feed them. Thank you. Because what you okay. just said, I understand much more about where you're okay. coming from. Thank Absolutely. you. Uh, and probably, uh, well, I have two more notes. Do I have to do Can I ask one other quick question? Sure. You said one thing which I found very striking, and perhaps you could just okay. amplify it a little bit. Uh, you said that um, in this picture, it, it gauge theory is an approximation. What yes. did you mean by that? Is it possible just to say a little bit more about what you mean by saying the gauge theory is an approximation? Well, it's like it's an approximation like, to what? Uh, <laughs> to whatever to all the gauge theories there. Um, QED is, is a well, you know, it's really funny to think that uh, we can do a very precise statistical measurement of not being able to measure the only measure one part of a quantum state, but. Because because it's an because the math is an approximation, we're not getting the, the perfect, the precise all of the information that's possible from the from that from any of the gauge theories. So they they you know to give a better answer, I'd have to look up and quote somebody who really knew how to say it properly about gauge theory being an approximation. But if you're going to violate the uncertainty principle, it'll it'll be probability one. Yeah, in, I, I one, in one measure, in one shot, not like the elitzer Bateman <laughs> multiple passes through the interferometers and the uh, and the uh, passes. Yeah. Well, I think I get a glimpse of the play. Uh, essentially, if um, if there is this kind of underlying theory, mm -hmm. uh, then um, it would automatically give you um, some gauge fixed and conditions. Conditions you wouldn't have to think of the gauge. Um, you wouldn't have to think of gauge invariance as, 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 as it were. As posing this question, this conceptual question, well, how can essentially just bits of mathematical fluff actually affect the way that matter moves around, which is this deep conceptual mystery. It's, it's sometimes been said, I think rightly, that understanding the gauge principle is, is actually the deepest challenge for the philosophy of physics in our time. Uh, I, I think I could just glimpse a sense in which this would perhaps provide a, a, a way of understanding the inner meaning of the gauge principle, but um, well, it's quite well, so There's a lot to be thought about here. I didn't keep my thing, but I googled gauge theory as an approximation, gauge theory the antibiotic approximation, the last of treatments, but in Yang Mills, you know, I, I think you can find the, um, find the, I'm, you know, I, I'm a polymath, but that means how could I not be a dilettante? So I, I see something, I say, yes, this is what I need. And that, I know I could go there and get it, but I, I just use enough of it to make my case. So I, I apologize for that. I have a question. All right. Um, could you say a little more about the way you think of the problem which you call the nature of the observer, mm. based on the, the earlier comment, which is the nature of reality? On the assumption there's one reality first, and then later. Uh, in a reality, I look at our Hubble universe as a reality for us. 
You know, would, I don't believe in the Big Bang. If you went out to the Hubble attenuation, you would. So I, I solved the mind-body problem to my happiness. And it's not a mind equals brain. I think that's nonsense. You need a Cartesian or some other kind of a life principle to do that. So then, having done, having solved the mind-body problem in that guise, and, and again, this is experimentally, we'll soon be able to break down the first person and third person barrier, and that will be some of the new technologies. The, um, this, then I realized that understanding the mind-body problem was, wow, but that's the nature of the mind, but the real understanding of existence is understanding the fine structure constant. The fine structure constant is not fundamental yet. We do that in terms of a whole bunch of other constants. The unified field theory will finally give us a handle on the... And then, in a multiverse, you have each Hubble sphere for that set of observers. It's like just one of the grapes on a star in a multiverse of... And it's interesting that in a sense, a scripture that you would normally think, you know, 50 years ago would be nonsense. Worlds without number have I created, like the rains of sand at the seashore. You look up and see the stars, and you can't... Now they say there's 800 billion in our galaxy and 1.3 trillion in Andromeda. But if you look at the Hubble narrow front thing, you see, you see as many galaxies as you can see stars. So how do you, how do you have... You know, how do you want to deny an anthropic, some anthropic property to that? And once you put an anthropic property into that, then, well, I did a crazy, uh, what I thought even for me was crazy. I'll, I want to want to finish the sentence if I can do it fast. I'll redirect you back to my third okay. question. All right. You said first person and third person. Do you yeah. believe that they are any choices? Well, what are the other choices? You know, other uh, um, Pleiades yeah, or? You are involved. You are not separated from either in the sense of the universe just not changed by you looking, we're or you are not changed by you looking at you. We're separated in three space, in the holographic background, we're, in, we're that entangled. Is, that's your assumption. Uh, you know, I don't okay. see how you can get out of it by, by the EPR okay. experiment. You there are the people way. who think sure. you're a third way. Well, this, okay, this I would is, like to hear that. This is taking a very interesting direction, some of this, but um, mm. I think it's perhaps time to close things down in the general forum here. And lunch. 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 We'll go for lunch, <laughs> reconvene at 2.30. Uh, Lou's going to tell us more about, uh, more, more, more about quantum computing and about my and fermions, if the talk hasn't changed. That's 2.30 sharp, back here. Thank you.